I want to ask, where are we? Mm -hmm. When you go driving around a neighborhood mm -hmm. and you see someone's yard and you see a lot of people's yards, what is it that you're seeing? And what does that tell you in terms of our sort of general sensibility in this place or general knowledge about the place where we live, the actual natural place where we live? I think there's actually quite the disconnect between what a front yard would look like and nature. Hmm. I see Kentucky bluegrass being used as a carpet, basically, that's being rolled out. So you're just extending whatever carpet or hardwood floor you have inside and then stepping out onto a carpet outside. And it sort of just exists in the spaces where everything else is not. You might want to put in a flower bed or a garden box, but you're sticking that up against a fence. And then now the carpet is now just a slightly weirder shape and continues to just be the thing covering the floor. Yeah. And when that carpet is also incredibly inefficient to weed, water, and maintain, I start to feel irritation, you might say. Yeah, I think there's a disconnect. I see so much grass in Salt Lake, just more grass than I could ever even comprehend being used front yard, backyard, side yard, just as the default. And we could do better. Yeah. What's the history that, right. you, that you understand about how we got to where we are? Right. I think it was a multi-part journey. Hmm. And it started with grass lawns being the symbol of wealth and excess that you could have over in the old world where you didn't need to grow food and you didn't need fruit trees and you didn't need vegetables. So we could play croquet, Victorians being Victorians. And that was the symbol of like wealth and luxury. That's its own thing that existed over there. I could go on forever about how the Victorians specifically really wanted to grow stuff that shouldn't be growing there. It was like a point of pride to be able to grow all of these exotics and bring in all sorts of things from the tropics and just non-native species and trying to make it work with their ecosystem rather than just embracing the ecosystem as it is. And a grass lawn is kind of a part of that. And it was a challenge. And the grass lawn in England, not necessarily because it no. rains there yeah. and it rains on the East Coast. The problem is it became this symbol of wealth and status, like you've made it if you have this. And then that began to be applied to other climates and ecosystems where it doesn't rain necessarily or at all. Then we get over to the United States in the 20th century, and we don't even really see grasslands rise in popularity until the 20th century mm. when the modern suburban development came into play. And I think it started with Levittown on Long Island in the early 20th century, where they're putting in a mass development of homes that all need some sort of green thing growing in the front. And it turns out that bluegrass is incredibly inexpensive for a developer to install, while also being incredibly expensive for a homeowner to maintain, which then fuels like a multi-billion dollar lawn care and landscaping industry. And now we are starting to understand why it's so popular, because a developer in Levittown and a developer today can roll out the sod and brush their hands off and walk away. And it's just easy for them. It's thoughtless for them. With Levittown and with suburbia kind of taking shape and being what it is, developers were able to channel this symbol of wealth and the American dream and you've made it and you have this beautiful front lawn while also just sort of wiping their hands and saying, have fun mowing that for all eternity. We're going to send somebody back and charge you money to mow it once a week for the rest of forever. And then we're going to charge you the utility bill for watering it. And now here we are. And that just became the standard culturally. And I don't hate it so much on Long Island, New York. I really dislike it here in Utah and in Tucson, Arizona and wherever else water is really a problem. It tells you what? That there's green grass in Tucson, Arizona or Salt Lake City. What does that reflect? It's just a lack of, again, connection maybe. It's not considering the natural ecosystem in which you are living because we paved over it. Like we used to be in a prairie valley down here and up there was a gorgeous high elevation mountain ecosystem. This is in northern Utah along the Wasatch Front and we paved over that prairie. We have no connection to like the low prairie grasses that used to grow here like blue grandma grass and little blue stem and big blue stem and switch grass and all of these things. Some of which can be mowed into a lawn like surface and actually want to grow in our climate and our soil. But that's not the standard. The standard is roll out a sod of bluegrass. I will be the first to admit it feels amazing barefoot. It's nice and cool and enjoyable. It's also really annoying to mow. And if I have to ever push a lawnmower in a circle around a tree trunk again, I will throw something. I think it's the silliest thing in the whole world. I want to get something out of the way. How is it, Daryl, that you talk about all of this without coming across as a scold? 
Mm. or being overly judgmental. You can't always just preach to the choir, right? Right. You want to give people a sense of how it's supposed to work. How do you think about it, I guess? Well, I don't want to scold an individual homeowner for having grass. I mean, most of the time the grass was there when they got there, and they're just trying to maintain an existing landscape. And you'll find if you just stop watering that bluegrass in the heat of summer, the bluegrass is going to go dormant, but your bindweed sure won't, and your mallow sure won't. So I'm not saying you need to just feel so guilty for every drop of water that you're using. I do think the collective impact of many, many homeowners making small but significant changes is worth talking about, but I'm not going to shame an individual person. I mean, they're not in charge of water legislation. They're not the ones opening the reservoirs. I'm not going to put that blame on them. I do think collectively, if we could all save a couple thousand gallons each, a couple tens of thousands of gallons each, now we're really talking some big numbers. So I'm just trying to help people shrink the size of their lawn into something a little more manageable. Also, just from a mowing standpoint, that sells people more than the water. What if you just mowed in a circle for 10 minutes instead of spending an hour and a half of your life every Saturday mowing? Then we'll point three high efficiency sprinkler heads at this new shape that we've designed in for you for your simple lawn, and we'll cut your water use by 80% and everybody wins. You want someone's yard to be useful. Yes. But also enjoyable. Right. Yes. I think a lot of the disconnect happens is that when somebody thinks about converting their lawn from just what it is now to a quote unquote sustainable landscape, yeah. they think, well, I'm not going to get to enjoy that lawn anymore because now I have to care about the environment. Right. And, and there has to be, be a bunch of lava rock around yeah. me. And around. there shouldn't be. And we can get to that, but there <laughs> should will. not be. We'll there should not that. be. Yes. I design landscapes for humans first, actually. Mm -hmm. And the first part of our design process is layout planning where we ask the client, what are the major activities that we want your yard to facilitate? Do you need more social spaces? Do you need a garden? Do you need a hobby area? Like, are you really into badminton? Like just these things, because a sustainable space is one that is used and enjoyed and therefore maintained because you actually are out there. And I see no value in creating like the most complex native ecosystem possible in somebody's backyard if they're never going to go out and spend time in it. What are we in terms of a climate? Like you often hear we're the mm. second driest state in the country. And then I think people figure, okay, that means our yards should look more like a yard in Santa Fe or Phoenix or right. whatever. But what are we? Describe our region, our regions, our climate. So eco-regions are incredibly complex yeah. and there's so many different factors that make up a climate or a microclimate or an eco region and elevation has a lot to do with it and we have an incredibly diverse range of elevations at which people are living here here in the valley i would call us a cold desert ecosystem a high elevation desert but not necessarily a forested mountain yeah. ecosystem but then you had 30 minutes up the road and suddenly we're in a high elevation forested mountain ecosystem with a completely different set of plants and a completely different climate and light conditions because of the tree canopies and whatnot. And then you move down to St. George and now we're in like an actual subtropical desert ecosystem with its own incredibly complex set of needs for those plants. So it really just depends where you live. Here in the valley, there was native prairie and meadow and high elevation drought tolerant plants just growing mountain range to mountain range and they're all gone now. Was it beautiful? Yeah. We ever just looked at a, a mountain range in the distance and a gorgeous meadow with yeah. wildflowers That's and grasses swaying in the breeze. Yeah. You want to get us back there in some way. In some way, yes. I mean, obviously humans need to live somewhere. Sure. I am not trying to say that we shouldn't. I'm actually very passionate about urban design and like making human spaces nicer for humans and then integrating green infrastructure or whatever we need to do there. I do think it's really sad if you think about a habitat for the birds that would eat the seeds from those wild flowers, let's say, and then you slice that habitat in half by putting in a big road. And then now there's houses on each side and everything's been clear cut. So now we're starting at zero. And I do think we could do more to bridge the gap and we could do more to make our own individual yards more hospitable for the wildlife that we've displaced while also just making our lives easier because there's stuff that wants to grow here. So why are we trying to grow stuff that we have to fight to make it grow when there's stuff that's just going to do it on its own if we just facilitate that? The point you make, and I think again may surprise some people who have in their minds the idea of what sustainable means. Mm. You make the argument that really the nature of this place is, this is how you've put it, green 
and cooling. And you even said incredibly lush. Mm. Yeah. I mean, have you ever been walking down the street and it's pavement everywhere and then you past the park or you pass even just like a very lush front lawn in somebody's yard with a couple of trees. You get that breeze. Immediately it feels 10 degrees cooler or something. Pavement is hot. Rocks are hot. When I say that we used to have a gorgeous prairie, we did not have a bunch of lava rock and a couple of agave plants sticking out. So your front yard doesn't need to look like that because that's not what wants to be here. That's not what grows here. Now, if you're in St. George, that's a different story. We can talk about that later. The desert has amazing wildflowers, y'all. So it's not like you need some cacti and some rocks either. Just depends on how we choose to arrange it. If you had densely planted native plants here, I'm I'm thinking of northern Utah and I'm thinking of our native grasses like little blue stem and blue grandma and our native wildflowers planted in a gorgeous arrangement with all the colors in bloom at different seasons, it's going to look like a million bucks and it's going to be lush and it's going to be cooler than if you just had a bunch of rocks. Because if you've ever stood on a gravel pad in full sun, I'm not having fun when I'm doing that. I don't think you're having fun. You've described this as a kind of gross or correction. Well-intentioned, mm. but not a way of thinking about it holistically, I guess, right? You mean xeriscaping? Yes. Yes. So this phenomenon of taking a lawn that does consume a huge amount of water and saying, let's just cover it in gravel and put a couple of plants in here and there. We'll have landscape fabric underneath and we'll just route some drip irrigation around these couple plants and call it good. It's nice that it saves a lot of water. I'm not sure it's going to save the homeowner that much money mm-hmm. because now I'm thinking about what the collection temperature of that property is and how much more the homeowner's paying in air conditioning. I don't have the facts and the figures, but I would not be surprised if that was a net neutral or you end up spending more on energy. And then you got the weeds because weeds love gravel. So I think Xeriscaping came about saying we need to use less water and then it answered that question, but didn't go further to say, how can we eliminate these other problems that this new form of landscaping creates? And I think that's just because there was this massive disconnect, both with the carpet lawn that we were talking about and xeriscaping where they're trying to do something but they're not thinking holistically and it doesn't actually mimic nature. Yeah. Where's the prairie? I pose the question, where is the prairie? Well, I want to get to the question also of why it is that weeds love Mm. rocks. But there are some terms I wanted you to sort of take us through, if you would. Sure. Um, One of them is this thing you've talked about called ecosystem succession. Can you take us through this? Because it gets us to this idea of a disturbance. Mm. Because a weed is telling us there's a disturbance, right? Would you explain it? Sure. Let's think about what a climax ecosystem is. That's a term that we refer to when we're talking about the development of an ecosystem. To me, a climax ecosystem is when all of the plants have reached maturity and there are different types of plants serving different ecological functions. There's trees providing shade. There's an understory providing cover and habitat for the wildlife. And all of these different plant and animal beings are living in harmony together. That's a climax ecosystem. That can be the desert down in St. George with the wildflowers and cacti or whatever else you might find there. That could be the top of the mountains right behind us to the east. But that's what a climax ecosystem is. And the, there's the, a balance. Yeah. Up. When the ecosystem reaches balance where you've got the owls are managing the rodents, everybody has their part to play. Yeah. Right. Great, beautiful circle of life. <laughs> And we had one here in the valley. It was a a prairie ecosystem, tall grass prairie. We paved over it, so it's gone. Every so often, something happens to reset an ecosystem back to zero, back to starting over. This is the disturbance. The disturbance. That could be a wildfire. That could be a flood. That could be somebody spraying a bunch of chemicals on the yard. That could be paving over it, clear cutting a forest, scraping the topsoil. Any of those things would be a disturbance to the ecosystem. So then we've reset back to zero. Let's say a climax ecosystem on the scale of one to five is five. Now we're at zero. One, the next step is something needs to happen to start repairing the soil and stabilizing it. Because if you don't stabilize the soil in a disturbed situation, you're going to have erosion. So weed seeds will travel by air. They'll land on this disturbed soil and they'll root. And by all intents and purposes, like if I were to give the weed a brain, if the weed was a person who could think, I would say the weed thinks it's doing you a solid because it's landing there and it's like, oh, this soil sucks. This is terrible soil. Let's root in. Let's stabilize it. Let's prevent erosion. We could pump nutrients into it. That's why a lot of weeds are actually in the legume family because legumes fix nitrogen. So black locust trees, vetches, 
all of these plants are fixing nitrogen. They're fertilizing the soil for you, but they don't look pretty. So we call them weeds. They're does, trying does that, to do their job. Bother you? Does that bother you, by the way? Well, it depends. The things that I consider weeds are invasive species. Sure. Things that are going to come and choke out native plants. I do not consider a native plant that just wants to be there and stabilize the soil or something. I don't consider that a weed. However, thinking about invasive species, a lot of these pioneer species that are coming in to stabilize the soil are invasive because the only thing that can thrive after a disturbance is the most hardy, most ready to go of plants, right? And that's an invasive species. Invasive grasses, again, I, I bring up bindweed because it's the bane of my existence. They can thrive in anything, they can grow anywhere, so they're the first to show up. I wanna talk about lawns. You've described yourself as pro-lawn. In Now look, people's, before you get to the um, the butt. The butt. This is going to raise a few hackles when you hear that you're pro-lawn. Explain. Explain what you mean. How do you think about lawn? I'm pro playing fetch with your dog. I'm pro having a picnic with your children or playing soccer, throwing a football around. I'm pro like having those human experiences in a yard. And I think a yard that is used is a yard that has the potential to become a sustainable space. So there are smarter ways to use grass. Like I said before, we can design in an efficient shape for the grass that can be mowed really quickly, watered with two to three high efficiency sprinkler heads instead of whatever the heck we're seeing with these six zones and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And we can apply amendments to the soil that make regular old Kentucky bluegrass more drought tolerant. There are things we could do before we even get into. There are Changing the yeah, bluegrass itself, There's right? smarter versions of grass that we could do. Yeah. I mean, lawn alternatives, warm season grasses. I mean, there's all sorts of things that we could put there instead of bluegrass. But I also, if you really like the bluegrass or if you have really high energy dogs and maybe like a lower foot traffic lawn alternative isn't as ideal, keep the bluegrass, just make it efficient to water and mow mm. and have it be a small shape and then fill the rest of the square footage of your yard with drought tolerant native plants that don't need nearly as much water. And that's still a massive reduction. I think one thing you mentioned that was interesting, I hadn't thought about this. You say bluegrass wants to go dormant when it gets hot. Mm, yes. So the time when we want it green in the summer, it doesn't want to be because it wants to go dormant. It's too hot. When it gets like, what, 80 degrees or something yeah. like that, it sort of shuts down or yeah. wants to, right? Yeah. So when we water the hell out of Kentucky bluegrass in August, the water isn't providing necessarily nourishment for the grass, not just doing that. It's actually just fooling it into thinking it's... The cool season. The cool season. The rainy season, right. yes. So there are two different types of grasses. There are cool season grasses and warm season grasses. And I think folks are confused when they hear that your bluegrass lawn is a cool season grass. Because they're like, what do you mean? I use it in the summertime. It wants to be alive and well in the cool seasons, in places where it would grow kind of on its own, like the East Coast, or talking about England again, February, March, April, May, October, November, September, those times, it really wants to be alive. And then when the warm season rolls around, because it's a cool season grass, it's just going to go dormant. And what folks don't realize is that when they stop watering their lawn and it gets crispy and thatchy and brown, that's dormancy. That's not them letting their lawn die. It's just dormant. It'll wake right back up the minute you put water on it again. And so overwatering at the capacity that we are doing, we're just tricking Kentucky bluegrass. I keep giving plants brains, but I, I guess I think plants have brains. I don't know, but we're tricking the bluegrass. We're confounding it into having it believe that it's the cool season. Are you trying to get people to say, oh, look, look if you want the Kentucky bluegrass, fine. There's a way to make that work, mm -hmm. but why not try something else? So what is out there that people can try that would still be nice to play fetch on? or get out and wander on your bare feet? Like, w what else is out there? There are so many different alternatives, and it really depends on the unique light conditions and situation of your yard for me to tell you which one is absolutely perfect yeah. for you. Mm -hmm. But if you had a full sun area that is taking a ton of water to keep bluegrass alive, and I say full sun because a warm season grass, if we think about it being the opposite of a cool season grass, it's green and lush and happy from May to October, which is the time we want to be out using a lawn. So warm season grass is this really underutilized resource, I think, especially in Salt Lake, that we could be having as our primary turf grass material for both front and backyards but you need that full sun for it to break dormancy in April or May. So if you had a really shady yard, we would want to talk about other alternatives besides 
a warm season grass. Buffalo grass is the one I would probably recommend first because it is a warm season grass that is native to the U.S. It's native everywhere from Montana to Mexico, this whole area, and it is almost xeric once it's established. You are not watering this grass beyond maybe that July, August time where it just doesn't rain. You might want to throw the sprinklers on once or twice, but other than that, you're not watering it and you're also not mowing it because it maxes out at three inches tall. Why? I pose the question, why are we using Kentucky bluegrass that we have to mow once a week and we have to apply all of these fertilizers and we have to water it to oblivion? And it's because it makes a lot of people money to do all of those things, I think is why it's popular. When we could have this gorgeous warm season grass that's awake and happy May to October, it goes thatchy and brown the rest of the time. And that's just something we would deal with at that point. And you don't mow it. And you don't water it. It makes me sad that it's not, that more people don't know about this. I want to ask about water and I want to ask about rainwater, actually, because this is something you're an expert about. Collecting rainwater seems so daunting for people who, it's a lot of work, right? I mean, how are you thinking about rainwater, actually? Because I think there's a misimpression about, we talked a little bit about this off air before, like get a barrel and how do you do it? But talk to us about rainwater. It doesn't have to be complicated and it doesn't have to be a lot of work. I think people fail to comprehend how much water is being collected off of the surface of their roof. A thousand square feet of roof, and most homes in Salt Lake are more, they have 1,500 or 2,000 square feet, but a thousand square feet of roof collects 600 gallons of water per inch of rain. We get 22 inches of rain a year in Utah, not counting snow melt. That's tens of thousands of gallons of water per roof coming off every single year. I think it is the great tragedy of suburbia that we are French draining that water to the street and then paying to bring somebody else's water back. Why? Again, I pose the question, (laughs) why? So I want to slow that water down from the moment it exits your downspout and then the moment that it would reach the storm drain or the street, I want to slow it down on its journey through your landscaping. I don't necessarily need you to have a barrel. If you want to collect some extra rainwater on the way so that you can water your garden, that's fine. But to me, there's no point of having a 55 gallon rain barrel at the bottom of your downspout if you're still spending hundreds of dollars a month to water your landscape. Because then, okay, great, you're watering your garden with rainwater, but you're still bringing somebody else's water to your yard. I'm just not seeing the sustainable benefit at this point. So in Instead, let's point your downspout at your native landscaping. This is landscaping that is adapted to the rain and dry out periods of our region because they are used to growing here with the caveat in parentheses that our climate is changing and they might need a little more help as things get hotter and drier because they are not adapted to that. They're adapted to our thousands of years of existing here, but they're adapted to it. So let's point the downspout there. We do a thing in my field called passive earthworks design, passive rainwater harvesting design, where that flower bed we're pointing your downspout out is just a little bit lower than the rest of the landscape, sort of forming a trough. We call them swales or basins that will catch the water and allow it to percolate back into your soil. And then if that fills up, it keeps going. And then it maybe catches in another one and percolates. And if that fills up, it keeps going. And we're just slowing the water down on its way out. And suddenly, especially if you are using native plants, your need for irrigation has gone down from, let's say 100% down to 50%, maybe down to zero, depending on how efficiently you're doing this and how many native plants you're using. I will say there are yards in Tucson, Arizona, that's where I did my rainwater harvesting certification. There are yards using native plants in Tucson, Arizona that are using zero supplemental irrigation, zero in Arizona to keep their plants alive. So it's possible here, they get eight inches of rain a year, we get 20, we're luxuriating in water by comparison. So this is not an impossible feat. So this started as a hobby, Mm -hmm. right? When did you start taking interest in this? Since you were a kid? Honestly, no, believe it or not. Yeah, I grew up very disconnected from nature, actually. We were an indoorsy family. Mm. We didn't do a lot of outdoor, like adventure, for example. It was in my 20s. I was working at a desk indoors, fluorescent lighting, sometimes, depending on the office, no windows. So I felt very disconnected from nature. And I started a backyard garden just to have something to do where I was outside and my hands were in the dirt. And then that, you know, that started with four boxes that suddenly became half of my backyard and then subsequently became my entire personality. (laughs) And I just sort of kept going with that. I think as I was looking for more efficient ways to garden in that sort of annual vegetable gardener sort of sense, I was encountering these inefficiencies with looking at a yard like agriculture instead of just looking at it like nature. (gasps) 
And that opened a door for me. And I think the first big light switch was learning about buffalo grass. There's a lawn product out there that I don't need to water and I don't need to mow. What are we doing as a society? And that just opened the floodgates, literally and figuratively. I'm not sure how much you want to talk about this, but you got a diagnosis late in life. Mm. ADHD, late onset adult autism. How much of that influence the way you were thinking about it? What's the personal connection to the way you think about that disconnect, the way you think about Mm. plants and ecosystems? It's not surprising that the way your brain works influences what you do every day and how you see the world. So that's fairly straightforward. I got the diagnosis very late in life because I was working in a job that was not satisfying to me. I was working in luxury hospitality marketing. And when you're an environmentalist and you're selling private jet flights, that feels bad. So I wasn't happy and I was going to therapy in order to just be like, hey, this is bad. I don't feel happy with my life. And my therapist basically was like, well, I have some news for you. (laughs) You're 29 years old. We should pursue these diagnoses for you. And I did. And it turns out that an artistic trait and a trait of ADHD is the ability to absorb and retain information very quickly. And so I knew that I'd experienced my entire 29 years of life doing that, but now I had a word for it. And there's also a thing called pattern recognition, specifically with autistic folks, where I can sort of walk into a yard as a designer. I'm I'm now work entirely as a landscape designer, and I just see the end result in Mm -hmm. my head. And I didn't know that that was a abnormal thing, a special thing, a divergent thing until after my diagnosis came through. And I think to your question earlier when you were saying, how does it affect the way you see all of this? I think zooming out and suddenly understanding, okay, if we're using a Kentucky bluegrass lawn instead of buffalo grass, and we're putting 20 or 30,000 gallons of water on it a year, and then you step out and there's 50 houses in this neighborhood doing the same, and then you zoom out again, and then you start seeing the pattern of the watershed starting at the top of you know Mount Olympus behind us and moving down through the foothills and into the Jordan River and out to the Great Salt Lake. And you start seeing that pattern of like, oh, wow, we could really have collective impact on a much wider scale than just me not wanting to mow and water my grass. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it makes me think about the lake. And Mm -hmm. I wonder, how is the lake changing our thinking, do you think? I think it's increasing everybody's climate anxiety by exponential amounts. (laughs) Yeah. I think impending doom is an interesting motivator to folks, especially when you have people who are so highly invested in this valley, not just monetarily, but emotionally and historically. And people have lived here for their entire lives and generations of people living here. You don't want to just up and move if suddenly we live in a toxic dust bowl, which are scary words to say. And so it starts to be what can I do? What can my neighborhood do? What can my legislators do to maybe fix this? And I do think we are still at a point where like there is some hope. So I would like to channel that hope rather than go straight into jaded nihilism and use that hope to get some people excited about changes they can make on an individual level. So it it seems like this way of thinking is kind of a new phase that we're in where you've said it doesn't necessarily have a really good marketable name yet. I guess sustainable or regenerative. I mean, I don't know. Does it have a name the way you're thinking about all of this? Is this in a kind of an emerging? You mean the type of landscape design that I do? Yeah. Yeah. I call my studio, Yard Farmer, we call it a sustainable landscape design studio. But I think you bring up an interesting point that what does sustainable mean? It can be a greenwashing term, a marketing term. It can mean everything. It can mean nothing. I use it to describe that we're trying to make our yards do more good than harm. We're trying to provide a net positive for the environment rather than only negatives of we're going to spray chemicals and damage the soil and send those chemicals into the watershed and use a bunch of water that we don't have. We don't have that water to be spending, but we're spending it. And instead say, okay, a yard can be a benefit to wildlife, can be a benefit to your local ecosystem and create some sort of positive impact on your neighborhood. It can be a benefit to you. It can be a benefit to the people who walk by it every day because of the aesthetic value in the community that it fosters and whatnot. So that's how I use the term. I think it's an interesting point that you said that there's not really a term yet for this middle thing that is not bluegrass and it's not xeriscaping. Yeah. Yeah. Sustainable landscaping is where I'm at. That's just what I've landed on to call it. But essentially, it's I don't know if we would want to call it native scaping. Mm. Local scaping is a term that was coined by the folks over at the conservation garden and whatnot. And that is a similar idea in that it's let's pay attention to what's here. Yeah, I guess it's about going back to something you talked to us about, which is like there was a system in Victorian England. 
you talked about. This idea of people wanting to see if I could get this thing to grow. But they did, weren't asking the question of, should I get this thing to grow? I guess that's the question we should be asking, right? And it's unlearning that system that seems to be kind of baked into the culture, maybe. Do you think that's right? Yes, I think we don't ask why enough. You've heard me shout the word why yeah. at the top of my lungs several times. <laughs> we don't ask why are we planting this, that, or the other there. And I think the question, should I do that, should be asked more, just in general. Just give that all applications ubiquitously. But if you want to put in a grass lawn, why? Is the answer because you don't know what else to put there? Or is the answer because you really need a space for your four border collies to run? I think there's different applications for different use cases. And I want four border collies to have the space that they need. I don't want you to have a really expensive high maintenance carpet all over your front and backyard. Are you excited for spring? I'm so excited for the warmth and sunlight and so very tired already. <laughs> I actually really love winter because I love hibernating and resting because wow. this is such an active time for us. And I mean, right now we're in the throes of busy season, but really it's it's till November where we're just at a full sprint. But wait, when you're on a walk, right? Yeah. And there's Thank a, you. And there's a bud and there's another bud and this other tree is that's got to get you going, right? Thank you for bringing me back to the joy of it and not just my impending sense of stress and doom. I really appreciate that. Yes. I'm very excited for color. I'm excited to see the birds and the bees and the butterflies. Oh gosh, when I see my first hummingbird of the season, it's going to be a celebratory moment. I'm excited for that. And I'm excited to spend more time out in the sunshine, for sure. Thank you.